This time we'll talk about the appearance and structure of other galaxies. We went through an extended dance remix of exactly what the Milky Way looks like as a galaxy, and we discovered that it is the galaxy, meaning our home galaxy. We learned from Edwin Hubble's work that all other spiral nebulae are extraordinarily distant objects extremely far away, and that our Milky Way is one of the many island universes. But the real takeaway was that there are lots and lots of different types of galaxies. So once Edwin Hubble embarked on a major photographic survey using the 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson, he discovered that the cosmos is filled with these extraordinarily large, distant objects. Let's go see what they are. Hubble did his work between 1926 and 1936. During this amazing period, he took numerous deep photographs of the night sky and made amazing discoveries. He found that the bright galaxies in the sky, the ones that were within the telescope's reach, fall into three broad classes according to their shapes. This photographic visual survey was, of course, in visible light rather than the extensive wavelength coverage from modern telescopes. Let's now follow in Hubble's footsteps and examine visual representations or optical light representations of the various types of galaxies. And so Hubble's tuning fork is how he thought they had some kind of significance. He thought that they naturally progressed as an evolutionary standpoint from one step to the other. And so he found that 75% of all the bright galaxies were spirals, and about 20% seemed to be ellipticals, and about 5% or some sort, some sort of irregular, which don't fit any pattern. And this is his tuning fork diagram. He thought that it progressed from, say, left to right, from elliptical to spiral, thinking that you go from a simple looking thing to a more complex looking thing. But we now know that the Hubble tuning fork diagram has no intrinsic meaning. It just looks nice and is very helpful for you to remember the different types. So you can see we have different things at the beginning. These are the ellipticals. Then we have the lenticulars. Then there are the spirals. And there's the upper tree of the spirals and the lower tree of the spirals, which are called the barred spirals or the SBs. And from this point on, we're about to go into an incredible visual journey because you've probably not seen a lot of these different types of galaxies. And so it's my job in this particular lecture to give you a whole bunch of images and show you what the galaxies themselves look like. So here we go. I obtained all of the images that you'll see in this video from many different sources. The National Optical Astronomical Observatory, the AAO, or Australian Astronomical Observatory, the Gemini Observatory, the European Southern Observatory, the Keck Observatory on Mauna Kea, and many from the Hubble Space Telescope. The NED database is an excellent NASA database containing amazing collections of galaxy images. You gotta go Google these to check out all the amazing images that they have there. It's just simply awe-inspiring. Additionally, check out the wonderful astronomy picture of the day. Robert Nemiroff at Michigan Tech and Jerry Bonnell at the University of Maryland have done an amazing job curating daily astronomical images since 1995. Visit that website daily to see what they find for you. When a science is young, as it was in Hubble's time, and you don't know much, but clearly there's a lot to be learned, your first steps in every science are usually the same. You make a bunch of observations and try to group things together that are similar. In biology, the taxonomy of plants and animals leads us to judge first their appearances, and then we see what the critters do and how they live. But first, we need to identify and group everything. So we start our journey of classification with the elliptical galaxies, which are, obviously enough, elliptical in appearance. They don't have any internal structure, they don't have disks, they don't have spiral arms, then they don't have dust lanes. What they do have is a lot of old yellow and red stars, with the brightest of the stars being big red supergiants. Ellipticals are classified only by their apparent flatness. So if you see a circular looking one, that's an E0. If you see one that's really wide compared to its height and that it's really flat or smooshed or cigar shaped, then that is an E7, where it's up to about three times as wide as it is high. The numbers are slightly arbitrary, but they're based on the ratio of the long axis to the short axis. Ellipticals come in huge size differences, some that have trillions of stars down to tiny little dwarfs with only a few million stars. The smallest of the ellipticals can be smaller than the largest globular clusters, which means it's an active area of research about the boundary between these two classes of objects. They also contain no gas and dust, and no evidence of star formation. 
but giant ellipticals tend to have really large clouds of extraordinarily hot X-ray emitting gas that extends far beyond the optical boundary of the galaxy. Now we begin our beauty pageant. This is a classic giant elliptical galaxy. It's named Messier 87, and it's part of the Virgo cluster of galaxies. This picture was taken by the European Southern Observatory's Very Large Telescope at Cerro Paranal in the Atacama Desert of northern Chile. This is what clarity you can get with an 8-meter telescope at 2,600 meters in altitude under pristine dark skies. Sometimes when people look at these images, they're not sure what's the galaxy and what's not. Every single dot you see is a foreground Milky Way star. The galaxy is the misty halo glow. That misty cloud is the combined light of many billions of stars. Unlike the galaxies you'd see that may be considered more photogenic, this is fairly uniformly yellow in appearance. M87 itself lives about 16 megaparsecs away, that's about 50 million light years. Its diameter is about 132,000 light years, or 40 kiloparsecs. It's also an easy find in a small telescope in dark summer skies. As a giant elliptical, it rings in at about 5 or so trillion solar masses. That's 10 to the 12th solar masses. The total mass, including the very faint halo, well outside the visible image here, may be 200 times that of the Milky Way. M87 is big, and this is the galaxy that the Event Horizon Telescope observed to image the shadow of a supermassive black hole. I'll talk about these in a later lecture. There's just really so much to say about this one galaxy that I really should do a whole video just about it. Continuing the survey of morphology, this is NGC 1132. In this Hubble Space Telescope image, we notice there are far fewer Milky Way stars. That allows us to see that it seems to be in the middle of a whole number of tiny little galaxies. As a giant elliptical, it's fairly typical in galaxy clusters to see one such galaxy dominate over all its neighbors. All the little galaxies swarming it around it are either orbiting small ellipticals or deep background galaxies. Many of the little ones around it are known as a fossil group that arose after the merger of two galaxy clusters. If you think you see tiny dots, but not as sharp as the foreground stars of M87, that's because this giant elliptical is surrounded by thousands of globular clusters. This one is much farther than M87 at 81 megaparsecs in distance, or about 320 million light years. I'll frequently use both units for distance, but we really should use the megaparsec since it's a direct measurement based on redshift, but I keep both units for familiarity's sake. Next up is ESO 325-4, which is a giant elliptical with over 100 billion solar masses. It dominates the galaxy cluster Abel S0740. It's over 450 million light years away in the direction of Centaurus constellation. The diffuse halo of stars have what looks like pinpoints in it, and again, these pinpoints are actually globular clusters, each with hundreds of thousands of stars. This is one huge galaxy. Next is Messier 49. This image by Stéphane Guissard and Thierry Demange from Los Cielos de América, M49 is, again, another giant elliptical galaxy at about 17 megaparsecs away, or 56 million light years, another one in the Virgo cluster of galaxies. Its nucleus is emitting copious amounts of X-rays, indicating the presence of a supermassive black hole of approximately 6 times 10 to the 8th solar masses, or 600 million solar masses. This galaxy also has about 6,000 globular clusters, which is far more than the roughly 200 orbiting our Milky Way. These massive galaxies always have a coterie of globular clusters that were created by galactic mergers. M49 was the first member of the Virgo cluster of galaxies to be discovered, because it's the most luminous member of the cluster. As for its type, it's an E2 type because it's nearly round. Now here is Messier 59, also in the Virgo cluster of galaxies. It was discovered by Johann Köhler in April of 1779, while he was observing a nearby comet. Charles Messier listed the galaxy in his catalog three days after Curler's discovery. Back then, there was an intense rivalry to discover comets. For some basic stats, this galaxy also lives at about 15 megaparsecs away, and it's an example of an E5 elliptical, which means its long axis is about twice the short one. 
Now we're looking at Messier 105. It's an E1 type and holds the honor of being the largest elliptical in the Messier catalog that's not in the Virgo cluster, at 11 megaparsecs distance in the constellation Leo's M96 group of galaxies. Saving the biggest for last, this is one of the largest galaxies in the universe. ESO 383-76 is an elongated, X-ray luminous, supergiant elliptical galaxy. It is the dominant galaxy in the Abel 3571 galaxy cluster. It's at 200 megaparsecs distance, or about 650 million light years away, with a diameter of about 540 kiloparsecs, or 1.8 million light years, it is one of the largest galaxies known. It also contains one of the most massive black holes with an estimated mass somewhere around 2 billion solar masses, but that black hole could be up to 30 billion solar masses in heft. The diameter of this galaxy is greater than the distance between the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy, M31. Even at 650 million light years away, Deep exposures show that its angular size is bigger than the full moon. That size means there are at least two trillion solar masses of material that make up this entire galaxy. That's 10 to the 12th suns. But we know that most stars are much smaller than a solar mass, so it's easily got over 10 to the 13th individual stars. And with what we know about exoplanets, maybe 10 to the 14th planets. That's amazing for such an innocent looking little smudge. On the other end of the size range, we see the neighborhood dwarf elliptical galaxy Messier 32. It orbits the Andromeda galaxy and lives about 2.5 million light years away. It's a tiny thing less than 100 light years across, but it's compact and contains some tens of millions of solar masses. This is so packed with stars that any planet circling any stars in that galaxy might never see a dark night sky. Just like all other ordinary elliptical galaxies, M32 contains mostly old, faint red-yellow stars, and with practically no gas or dust, and therefore no star formation is currently happening. The vast majority of elliptical galaxies are little ones like these. Now these images are taken by NASA's Hubble Space Telescope showing four members of the Virgo cluster of galaxies. This is the nearest large galaxy cluster to us. NGC 4660 and NGC 4458 are good representatives of normal elliptical galaxies, and IC 3506 and VCC 1993 along the bottom are what we call dwarf ellipticals. In general, ellipticals contain very little or no gas or dust, we don't see any H2 regions and their pink glows, nor do we see dark lanes and obscure stars behind them. This lack tells us that star formation ended billions of years ago for these galaxies, and therefore they contain only old population two stars. They look elliptical and spheroidal because their stars move in random orientations. These galaxies are frequently the end state of merging events that quickly burn up all the building blocks for young stars. Now let's see what other kinds of galaxies live in our cosmic zoo.